Sean Anderson, who is the chair of the Environmental uh, Science and Resource Management, uh, has been involved for years in that field. Uh, he's done great work, and he's done it personally, but he's also done it with students. He's taken students out into the field. Uh, he takes them to different parts of the United States. Um, he has plans to take students to New Orleans. Uh, he has plans to take students up and down the Central Coast and to help them understand the kind of challenges that we face if we're going to move to a more sustainable way of living in relation to the environment in which we find ourselves. Uh, he has worked not only on the Thomas Fire, but the Goleta oil spill as well. Um, he's been here since uh, 2005. Um, and he is one of those people who every day makes an incredible difference uh, to our students and on this campus. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sean and let him talk to you about uh, the Thomas Fire. Thank you. Way too kind. Way too kind. <clears throat> the great, there's many interesting things about the Thomas Fire. One, I get to give presentations with a beer which normally does not happen. But in my, I gave a presentation to Ventura, the city of Ventura, and they gave me beer, and apparently that's the thing about the Thomas Fire. Uh, before I, I start talking, though, let me say a couple things. First, please interrupt me. If you guys have any questions, please raise your hand, stop me, that's, that's all good. Um, secondly, before I get too far into the, the weeds here, I need to make it very, very clear that I help do this, but all of the work is done by my colleagues and my students. And so some of them are right over there. So Emily, raise your hand there. Yes, yes, yes. yes. So Emily is an alumni, an alumnus of our program, and she's now our, our, our tech. So she fixes everything we break and makes everything work, so she's awesome. Next to her is Dr. Kiki Patch, uh, one of our great hires. One of our stellar hires a few years ago who uh, does all kinds of fantastic stuff related to sediment movement, uh, sustainability, all kinds of good stuff. Matt and Chase next to them are the two students that have done a lot of the pictures snapping that I'll show you in a second. So um, those folks and so many others that aren't here tonight really do all the work. I just sort of stand around and say silly things at times. So, um, so they're, they're really the ones doing all the stuff here. Um, let me tell you about the Thomas Fire. So a couple things before we start. One, we're interested in understanding what the Thomas Fire is all about, but I want to start by telling you um, how I truly believe we do things uh, differently than our, our fellow institutions. And that's not to slam anybody or say any bad will, but truly we have a different approach to stuff here, and it is really a different philosophical approach. I've been at, I did my undergrad at UCSB, I did my PhD at UCLA, I was up at Stanford University for many years. I've, I've worked with different colleagues and wonderful colleagues at different universities. This place is absolutely fundamentally different. It, it truly is. And that difference is what allows us to do a lot of these things I'm going to tell you about in a second. So we all know the Thomas Fire, this is uh, December uh, 4th, and this is downtown Ventura, and all the craziness that that ensued. I want to talk about that, but first I want to um, set the stage for this, set the stage for you in, the, in terms of CSUCI. When we go out, so that's Emily and Chase right there, those, those two right, right over there. So this is the fire, let me be clear, when these natural disaster things happen, these aren't some 50 year old expert that's been doing this for you know 40 years or something. These are our undergrads that we've prepared in our classes and that are, are being trained to how to deal with this stuff and how to respond to a dynamic changing world um, every day. And so when something like this pops up, they're there and they're ready to respond, and they have responded fantastically in so many cases, the most recent of which is uh, the Thomas Fire. So we use a lot of these, this technology in, in the suite of tools that we have, mostly that began life as a class activity or as a, a, a priority for undergraduate research. And so in this case, this is, we're above Ventura. This is one of our, our flying robots, a drone, a UAV. And it's mapping, um, in this case, uh, the area right above the uh, city hall in Ventura. But we've been getting ready for the Thomas Fire for years before the Thomas Fire happened. This is one of our um, many projects. So Dr. Phil Hampton is over there that does awesome stuff, including bringing a fantastic amount of 
Hispanic uh, serving institution funding and, 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 and support to our campus. This is a product of that. So let me be really clear. This is years and years and years in the making. This is planting seeds that might not bear fruit for some time to come. In this case, this is a group of our faculty and students. We've gone out to Santa Rosa Island and we're teaching them how to assess the beach, assess, assess our sandy beach. That turns out to be a really helpful thing in so many things. But in this case, these are students that, unlike my students at Santa Barbara or UCLA or Stanford or whatever, um, our students are much closer to the bone financially. Getting them embedded in research is an incredibly important step to get them to the next level of their careers. Many of our students, first generation college goers, they don't have uh, the legacy at home of people talking about opportunities and, and, and things that could be done with a college degree, so it's a bit of a foreign thing. And when they're barely paying for school, to tell them they should come volunteer with us in our lab, that's a hard ask. So what Phil has done, and many of our colleagues have done, is find funding sources so that we can take these kids and go and pay them for three or four weeks to start the summer up. It's not the same as paying them full time year round, but it's enough that they can not work at the malls, they can not work at in and out and they can, they can start to begin down that path of getting that key research experience that then leads to the next thing that leads to the next thing that leads to a different career path. So we've been doing this for some time in a whole variety of ways. There's a bunch of words here. I'm a professor. I say lots of words, so screw those words. They don't matter. Um, <laughs> the important thing is we have a variety of things going on. We have these upper atmospheric winds that are kind of swirling around us here at CSUCI. And we have these, this solid ship that we've been building in, in this example, in my program, but many of our programs have been doing fantastic things. So, for example, these upper atmospheric winds was that project, that project Assesso, that's paying students, getting them trained, right? In this project, this is both for community college students and our students. So this is, this is serving a wide swath. And I'll, I'll let, let you know, sometimes we get a little baloney with some of our rhetoric. Sometimes we say, oh, we're reaching out to the Hispanic kid or the this or that. No, what we do is we reach out to the kids that not only um, are underrepresented, but also on the edge. And that's really, really key. So we're not grabbing the A student whose dad is a doctor and this and that. We're oftentimes grabbing the C student and saying, we think there can be some potential in you. Come with us, come try this thing and, and check it out. And so Accesso is one of our many tools to do that. Um, we have our, our research station on Santa Rosa Island. It's been really, really helpful in getting students into different situations, uh, sort of unusual situations. We have brand, uh, relative, brand new, I'm old, right? Two years ago, we had these relatively brand new labs at Sierra Hall been transformational for our program and allowed us to do all kinds of wonderful stuff. In our, in our program, we do a lot of long-term monitoring. This is the boring, non-sexy stuff. This is, everybody wants to give money for the wing in the library. People don't want to pay for the janitorial service, right? And this is the janitorial service. We go out every year, rain or shine, and go and measure this element of the environment that doesn't seem that interesting, but sure as heck, when you have a fire or something, then everybody wants that. So we are well positioned to serve our community in that, in that capacity. We also do all kinds of service learning trips. So Louisiana, I'll be leaving with two of these folks right here in a couple days to Louisiana. The other two that are sitting next to them have come with us in previous years. Um, and we go to places like the Cook Islands, like Louisiana, like Costa Rica. We'll be sending a crew to Costa Rica again in a few days. And we pretty much go there and we act as a, more or less as a, a free consulting firm. So we go to work with, with uh, tribes or agencies or, or island governments or whatever that don't have access to a lot of fund and funds and we do work for them. So we monitor the environment, we count crocodiles, we count plants, and we help them understand how to better manage their system. So that's also a key part of what we're, how we're prepping. We have all kinds of industry partnerships. Most of us were just at the California Coastal Commission on Friday speaking to them about the work we're doing and trying to see how we can better help them serve their mission. And then we have all kinds of really cool tools. In this case, drones, and with a very interesting name, because I invented it, conservation mechatronics, which I don't know what that means, but it sounds kind of sciencey. And so, so that kind of stuff, which is blending our traditional interest in managing the natural world with this new suite of tools that we have, is really exciting. And our students do that. They fly it. They pilot the, the, the aircraft to go collect the data. It's really, really cool. And then lastly, true interdisciplinarity. 
Again, we use some baloney words a lot of times. We say interdisciplinary when it's the physical chemist and the biological chemist. Right, great, right? But when we say interdisciplinary, we mean we want those chemists to work with us and the econ economics folks and the history folks and the policy folks and the biology folks and all of that. That's really what we mean. We're truly about interdisciplinarity, not some kind of superficial thing to put on some, some grant application. And then lastly, truly our community facing. So when Dr. Patch came, when, when our new colleagues come, we first spend some time going around to the community, some of you guys at times, and say, what do you guys need? Not what do I need to furnish my academic credentials, what do you guys need as a community? And how can we craft a, a project to serve you and our students? So we've been getting ready for this voyage for many years. Quick example, this is uh, 12 hours after the start of the refugio oil spill. That's Chase over there is one of those. Paul, he's now up in San Francisco. He was working for one drone company making more money than I make, and now he's working for Intel, doing things with like Olympic drones and stuff. And so these are the students we train. Chase is just getting ready to graduate, so if anybody needs to hire someone, he's great. Um, but, but we're out here before all the big agency folks, right? These are our students. These are not some, some consulting firm. These are our students on the ground, in this case at El Capitan State Beach. And very quickly we find, because we're out doing stuff, people want to know what we're doing. And so we're one of the key uh, forces that helps interpret what's going on to the general public. In this case, this is one of our uh, graduates, uh, Tevin, who's talking to Channel 4, and nothing has changed with the Thomas fire. So same thing. So we're out there and, and people want to talk to us and, and understand, and, we, and that's an important function. We don't see that as a bad thing, we see that as another part of our community service that we help our community interpret what's going on and help them um, understand what's happening. Uh, again, out in the, out, outside, this is uh, all students doing this. This is all, um, most universities would be PhD students or master's students, something like that. These are all undergrads. Um, and a diverse suite of undergrads. Our program is built around pra practical skill base. Wow, so I need more beer up here. <laughs> um, so we really believe very much so in practical skill sets. We can't cram anything and everything in the curriculum as much as we would like, as much as I would like, right? We sacrifice a bit of theory to give them tangible skills. How do you fly that robot? Let's show you. How do you measure that pollution? Let's show you. What fish is that? Let's show you. And that makes a huge amount of difference in today's world where most of our fellow universities are not focused on that. They're far focused on the high-end NIH research, that kind of stuff is going to bring a gazillion million dollars. We're focused on skills that translate, in, translates in, that translate into jobs for these folks. Um, now, when the Thomas fire happened, I had just had my uh, tendon down here in my lower foot repaired because we're going on a backpack with my son in New Mexico this summer. So I was hobbled, so I have a boot on my foot. So, so um, that's me, that's the only picture of me because all the other pictures are of our students. Um, but even with that, we think it's, even when we have silly things on our feet or whatever, we think it's important to get out and use this adaptable suite of tools that we use in our classes and in other projects so Chase's capstone project here, he built this guy, which is a, a new, new uh, flying robot. And in its belly, it has a laser beam that it throws out and measures very accurately the topography of the coast. He wasn't ready with this. He wasn't done with this yet. But the Thomas fire happened. I'm like, Chase, can you pull it out? They're like, yes, let's do it, right? So, so again, our colleagues at our wonderful kick butt research universities around us have a bunch of money and they're doing very precise things on this one little project. We are student focused, we are teaching focused, so we want to get students out and about. So when we have this opportunity, we're much more about adapting our tools to the needs of the community and that was a, a great, this is a great example here. So for example, this is some image, these are some images from a few days ago. Um, Matt and Chase shot this, this is um, a Matilha Dam and we're looking straight down with one of our drones. So. Uh, one of our flying robots. So this is the burned area um, uh, along the sides. So these, these robots are really, really useful to help quantify what's going on with the vegetation, what's going on with the geomorphology. And by doing repeated flights on here, we can measure how, what, land, what parts of the, lands, of the hill have turned into landslides, which parts are still there, et cetera. So really, really valuable. These tools are not like an airplane. They don't cost a million dollars, right? We don't want to crash it, but if we crash it, oh well, a few thousand dollars, right? Um, much more versatile, much more flexible. We're getting all kinds of wonderful data from these tools. Not only do we use these tools 
um, in the places that just burned, in this case, we're at Carpinteria State Beach. This is right after the Montecito mud, mud slides happened, and we're going up down. You should not normally see this. All this stuff that's here is from the debris flows. This is all this gunk that's been blasted out on the beach. Um, very interesting. If, if you want to talk about beaches, you can talk to Kiki about all the interesting craziness that's going on here. We're flying up, and as we're moving um, northward or, or, or westward up the beach, we're getting to the dumping site where we're dumping a lot of this sludge and sediment that was left on the 101 and other, other uh, parts. So just to give you context, these are about four foot diameter, six foot diameter logs. These are huge, a huge amount of woody debris came down the hillside. Um, obviously these nice expensive homes, these people don't like this that much, it's a little hard to see here, but the surf here is black from all of the sediment. The fecal indicator bacteria here are about uh, 10 orders of magnitude higher than you normally would expect, way beyond the safe levels to, to swim and do that kind of stuff. And so in a second, um, we're gonna fly up and we're gonna get to the dumping site. So we can use this technology not just to look at the immediate effects of the, of the burn and this and that, but we can also use these tools to figure out how big an area was stuff dumped on. And that's what we're seeing right here, all this black stuff. That's essentially um, dumping of the sludge right in the ocean and then being bulldozed right into the surf. Something that I would not be allowed to do, but obviously in a disaster context, things get really crazy and we have to do something with all this waste. So we can use these tools to, to measure this and quantify this and figure out how much of an impact this is happening on the beach. And we can do also all kinds of cool stuff like this. So these are some of the tools we use. That's that same, those same images I just showed you. In this case, this, this looks like pictures. These aren't pictures. These are a, a bunch of little teeny tiny uh, point clouds. And this is a three dimensional program that we use and we can very accurately to high resolution of detail, measure the volume of, in this case, the dumped material and all kinds of cool stuff like that. We also get neat insights. Again, all this is stuff that these students are learning in classes that, um, that they're, they're able to apply in this disaster context. So in this case, we're looking straight down at um, the Ventura Botanical Gardens. Anything, anybody see anything unique about that? No. Burn, right, burn. All of this stuff, <coughs> this, nobody knew about. For the last 100, 150 years, nobody knew about this. We knew about this, we knew there were some walls here, this is a trail. This was covered in brush. If we look closer at that, you see this. This was a wall that was created during the mission era that is not mortared, that is, so it's very old, and the, the archeologists that did the survey last for the, for the mission uh, in 2011 didn't know about this. The folks who ran the botanical garden didn't know about this. So we flew our drones over and created a high resolution map that we know exactly where these really cool archeological uh, features are. And so now it's raining and some mud's gonna come down and this, that's gonna be hidden. But now with our maps, come springtime when everything dries out, we can send our archeological colleagues out here and they can much more accurately uh, excavate that, look at that. People don't even know what's going on here. Presumably some type of, of citrus planting. So there's a lot of bad stuff that we saw with this fire, but there's also interesting insights. Our students' interdisciplinary skill set and professional skill set has illuminated these, these um, gems in the rough, like this um, cool archeological story. We also repurpose a lot of the tools that we use in the classroom in the context of the Thomas Fire. In this case, this is a tool that uh, Kiki and Emily and a bunch of these folks are, have been using, um, which is an online survey tool that we normally uh, teach them in our, in our geographical information system classes. In this case, we repurpose it to look at wildlife kills. So we asked the general public, because a lot of the roads were closed initially, we couldn't easily get to some of these sites. So we asked the community in Ojai and Ventura, elsewhere, where did you see critters killed? And that's what you're seeing. So the hot spots are we see where we see very high levels of rabbits, deer, et cetera, uh, killed. And so this teaching tool has become a citizen science tool to help understand this, this initial part of the impact of the fire. We've also been very active in helping our students create digital identities for themselves. And so uh, I make my students blog, some of them hate it, but you know, life's tough, they have to do it. Um, but we also use these blogs ourselves. And so in this case, in the case of the Thomas Fire, our blogs were some of the ones that were checked very, very frequently by the general public to look at what was going on. Again, to help, it, help them interpret what was happening around them and using cyberspace as something of a public square. We then turned some of these, some of that, that same suite of tools um, uh, even more broadly to the general public and did a collaboration with folks up in Vancouver and, and other parts of the US and we created a website 
a community fire tracker to help people understand what the most up-to-date stuff in terms, of, in terms of what was happening, where the fire was going, what was impacted, where were disaster relief areas. Again, all tools that are available to our students and are used by our students all the time. And that's us just doing some networking to figure this out. Uh, almost done here before we start talking about actual Thomas Fire, what it did. Um, also, there's this really interesting world that we live in now. This is the social media world, which is kind of crazy. It can be beneficial. Beneficial like this guy right here. This is a Facebook post talking about one of our mountain lions that we recovered, um, whose paws were burnt, and we actually used tilapia, this, this cultivated mariculture or aquacultured fish, to wrap on, on uh, his paws to get him to reco be recovered. So social media is great. It's also, I, I almost put in some of the posts, but I, I didn't want to dignify them with the posting. All kinds of bizarre conspiracy theories spun up in the wake of this. Weather control, this is clearly all weather control, this is clearly a CIA thing. And, and that's a real thing. That's a real thing. I, I don't want to tell you how many media ask me about these kinds of things when we're talking to them. So it's even more important to have sources of objective, um, you know, community-based, honest, fact-based reporting that we could, we could rebut some of this silly stuff like UFOs and, and uh, weird things like that. Forget that, there's too many words here, it's too late. Um, the, it suffices, suffices to say all the stuff that we do with, with, this, with our response to the Thomas Fire and other things are based on our four pillars that we have here at CSUCI. When I came to interview, I sat down to someone, they said, where are you, where are you from? I said, where I'm from? And, I, and, and they said, uh, what's your mission? I said, mission? I said, what's your mission? I said, I don't know, to teach and do research. They said, oh, ours is to be student-centered, international focused, multicultural, interdisciplinary. I was like, oh, that's cool, I like that, it's great. Met the next faculty member, they said, where are you from? I said, where I'm from? And they said, what's your mission? I was like, what? I don't know, research and teaching? Oh, ours is student-centered, da, da, da. I'm like, what, Jonestown? I like, this is crazy, right? This is, they've all been prepped. Dick prepped them somehow, right? This is like a scam. I thought, this is creepy, I gotta get out of here. And then I realized, everybody actually believes it. All of my colleagues believe in those pillars. Karen believes in them, all these people believe in them. And it really is different. I can't, I can't express that more than my previous campuses and the campus where my, my colleagues are. It really is, again, the foundation for what we've done with the Thomas Fire and all the stuff that we've We've built here, and we're still trying to build um, with your guys' help. Okay, Whew. boom, done. Let's talk about the fire. Let's talk about the fire. Okay, so here, here's a quick eye test for you guys. So this is, you're going to the eye doctor, and you know, right, left, whatever. So here's a, here's a picture. So tell me, is this a healthy community, or is this? It's the same exact location. So it's like A or B, A or B, bifocals or trifocals, right? So, okay, so A or B? A or B? Okay, so who says A? Let's do a vote. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Oh, see, that's if I get my students. Nobody votes for a while. So who says A? Ah, there we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, and who says B? Oh, jeez. Oh, jeez, I messed it up. Ah, I screwed it. Okay, forget it. All right, here's the answer. The answer is right here. So 1874, this is, this is uh, just next to Yosemite. Uh, 1964. This inset is 1994. I can't show you a picture today because you can't see anything. All you can see would be trees. So we would actually say the healthier forest, the healthier condition is, is this, this less sparse thing, which might seem a little weird, right? Because there's more trees here. Isn't that, isn't that better? <coughs> Turns out fire is really key for helping keep these systems open and dynamic. This is a, 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 sketching, a sketch from John Muir in a book that he published in 1894 yeah. uh, from the same area, era, and it's a little pixelated because it was a small little drawing in a small little book. But this is John Muir on horseback, or, or, or one of his companions, excuse me, on horseback, right? They're walking around. I mean, they're, they're riding on the backs of horses. They're not ducking underneath branches. That's what the Sierras used to be like when we had a normal, healthy regime of fire. This is what it oftentimes looks like today. So we have all this underbrush, all this stuff that, that allows fires, when they do happen, to be much more um, expansive, much more intense than they otherwise would have been. At the same time, we're seeing a change, hold on, beer pause. We're also seeing uh, a change in what's going on with our broader environment. So in this case, this is a study done by some colleagues at UCLA. 
published in 2016. And this is the change snowpack from 1955 to uh, 2016. The red is less, less snowfall. What does that look like locally? That's what this looks like. This is a 31 year average, uh, sort of combining amounts of snowfall in the Sierra Nevadas. This is what it was like in the water year of 2015. So we are changing the water supply for our entire planet. Some areas are getting wetter, some are getting drier. In our case, we're basically getting drier. Um, we started tracking fires, scale of fires in California in 1931. And, uh, and so these are the, the largest fires. What you see is 14 of the last, of the 20 largest fires, here's Thomas Fire up here, are in the last few years, or since 2000. If we want to talk about specifically just in the last uh, decade, um, here's the 20 largest fires. Uh, these guys in red are all within the last decade. So we are getting more and more fires, more and more intensively, um, and at larger and larger scales. Here's, here's our home, right? So this patchwork, of, this patchwork quilt shows the extent of previous fires in recent years. So this big guy in the center here, this is Thomas, but you know, the day in 2016, Zafka in 2007, this is the new normal that we've inherited. When we talk about stressful water conditions, it's important to say last year it rained a lot, but like, no climate change, done. Right? That's for silly people, right? That's not true. That's not true. Um, and so we did get a lot of water, but these years of massive amounts of water and these years of lack of water, it's exactly what our climate change models are predicted. Exactly. And so in the case of, of here in Ventura County, wa last year, water, 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 woo, out of the drought. No. The only areas of the state, and so, okay, so this is, this is uh, uh, 2017, and this is just before the start of the Thomas fire, and this is drought intensity. So the darker the red, the more intense drought. So, okay, so, you know, so before it was really droughty, now we've kind of left it, but we've never left Ventura County, Southern Santa Barbara, we never left the drought condition. It was lessened. The Mojave Desert, they left drought condition. Shasta County, they left drought condition. We did not. So Ventura County is very, very literally the epicenter for dealing with our changing world and our changing climate. We are the focal point. For example, the kind of flames that we got during the Thomas Fire um, were very unusual. They were very uh, long, much longer than you typically would get, um, and they were crazy. <clears throat> the scale of the fire was also something that's hard to really understand. Here is right before the start of the fire, here's the next day. So this giant, giant illumination is not Los Angeles North. This is the Thomas Fire, which is mimicking in terms of li the light intensity, is mimicking and rivaling and exceeding downtown Los Angeles for us. Um, this, is, this is the final footprint, or, or the almost final footprint of the fire. Green was the first few days, and then the, the hotter colors are later on. But you see this huge run. This first color is really, really fast, fueled by these crazy Santa Anas. Santa Anas aren't unusual, right? We have Santa Anas here that blow from the inland to the ocean, but we have Santa Anas that blow for a day, or two days, or three days. It is highly unusual to have Santa Anas that blow at that intensity for two, three, four weeks, as we basically had um, in this case. And that really helped blowtorch the ignition sources over here. We now believe there were two ignition sources, not one, but two. And they went, whoop, and they ran to the coast. Um, and this is obviously the legacy that we have from that fire. All kinds of folks impacted, as well as wildlife uh, impacted, but in this case, downtown Ventura, where we have some homes totally new, totally devastated, others very close by are, uh, are okay and have persisted. All kinds of effects that people don't typically think about in terms of the fire, in this case, air quality. So all of us that were here know that it was peachy or orangey or yellowy for weeks on end. And I can't tell you the number of folks I ran into that were jogging. Clearly, I don't jog that much. But if I had jogged a lot, if I was a jogger, I wouldn't be jogging. I wasn't swimming during that time of the year, I'll say. And so here are these surfers out here that are wearing N95 particle masks just to go down to the beach. So all kinds of air quality issues are also associated with this, not only here at our mainland campus, but also on our Santa Rosa Island Research Station, right? 
So the smoke was blasting so, uh, so strong horizontally, and the fire was blasting so far horizontally. Our, our students who were out at Santa Rosa when the fire started were like, well, what the heck's going on, right? They could tell, even though they weren't on the internet, they could tell something weird was happening. We saw an incredibly complete burn over most of the regions of the Thomas fire. Typically, you get a fire and it burn this thing and then burn that thing. And uh, very commonly, we'll get in fires, we'll get the tops of the plants will be scorched or burned. But the, the tubers, the stuff down on the ground, they're, they're okay because the fire goes by pretty fast. Not this fire. M much of our area, we had at least 95% complete burn in terms of the vegetation, which was pretty unusual. What did it do? There's all kinds of measurements we can do. Um, we're still working on this. This is our first pass. But for example, we estimate that we um, emitted over the, the period of the Thomas fire 3.6 million tons of carbon dioxide. What does that mean? I don't know. It's a big number. But what that translates, and so, so our most recent California state emissions of CO2 um, are from 2015. It takes a long time to compile these, and it takes several months to QA, QC them. So the 2015 year is our most complete year to date. The emissions we calculate from the Thomas fire were equal to all the shipping, boating activity, maritime transportation, et cetera, in 2015. All of that activity that happened in or, or left state waters. Um, it's also equal to about 10% of all the agricultural associated emissions of the state. So this was a large amount of CO2 thrown up into the air. Um, again, because we're interested in a lot of different things, we're not just interested in plants. Um, another, another very interesting to us is the oil and gas legacy and history that is part of our county. So in this case, it's on the 150. This is an oil seep on fire. So there, there's no, the vegetation is all burned here. This is several days after the, the fire is blasted past this area. What we're seeing is the ground smoking. You can't put that out with water. If we drove up, a fire truck drove up and threw water, I wouldn't do it. So actually the fire is burned down into the earth and the hydrocarbons are on fire deep down. So to put this out, we have to have special chemicals and stuff. We actually blasted through all of our supply. We had to have stuff come in from New Jersey to try to put these things out. But to give you a sense of what was going on here, this is the footprint of the Thomas fire, and these are all the known oil wells and oil seeps that happened, uh, or, or, or the, that were exposed to during the fire. And so we estimate that about a fourth of all of our naturally occurring oil seeps uh, burned. Some of them were put out. The estimates are highly variable from between at least 30 and 50 were on fire that the fire department got to. But we, did, we got a call, so Matt and some of us are working on a project with one of our uh, citizens in, in, the, in this area. Um, they feel that they have a, a burning um, seep on their land. And they asked us to come up and can we monitor and find it. They called the fire department, fire department said, yep, you got a little seep fire, you know. Yeah, thanks, right? And all the vegetation had burned, so there was no danger for that. There, there was nothing they could, there's, there's no imminent risk except it stinks and it smells horrible and it's bad to breathe. Um, and so we were originally gonna fly one of our robots with a heat sensor, a thermal sensor, and then it turns out that maybe it's not gonna work. There's so many um, old, 100-year-old mines around there where people used to mine asphalt way back when, that that's most likely what's burning. So we're currently now working on a snipper, a hydrocarbon snipper, to snack on one of our, snack, that's a weird word, to attach to one of our robots. It's weird, it's as if somebody's been drinking beer. Um, but, but to attach, attach that guy to our, our probe and then launch it from these folks' house and go fly and see if we can locate the burn for them. Very jagged property. It's very difficult to hike over it, so you can't just get out and walk across. So those are the kind of things that we get calls from all the time, and we are more than happy when we can. We have the resources to help our community do that. Um, again, I mentioned, <clears throat> I mentioned these tools where we engage the public and do citizen science. So here's one of those examples where we're trying to uh, figure out, we have a long interest in wildlife and wildlife movement and all that kind of good stuff. And so we've been trying to uh, figure out what critters were killed in the fire and, and what was the effect of the fire on wildlife. So again, I, I showed, this, was, this is a slightly different version, but this is this map where folks have been reporting, this is an older version, so there's not as many dots, where people have been reporting. So we have now on the, I don't, I haven't queried it today, but about probably 130 different individuals reporting um, many hundreds of observed kills in the wake of the fire. Our understanding of what's going on with the Thomas Fire has been greatly informed by what happened here a few years ago. So this is our campus during the 2013 Camarillo Springs Fire, which was crazy, and there's all kinds of stories we can talk about that. Um, but we had been, and again, class-based stuff. 
So just, I was teaching a field methods class that semester, and so just before the Camarillo Springs fire happened, I had my students out to camp, what we, we used to call Camarillo Regional Park, now we call it University Park right here as you guys entered campus. We put out insect traps. How many insects? Cool. We put out camera traps. How many critters are walking around? Cool. And then the fire happened, we're like, what? Let's go see what the fire did. And then initially, we weren't allowed to go out, so then kind of illegally went out and put out some traps. And then we were able to have a very unique, it's a, it's a technical term, it's a, it's a, um, uh, uh, really unusual perspective that's been very valuable in terms of understanding what the fire did to our local wildlife. So this is our hills behind campus before that 2013 fire. This is our campus, these are the, our hills right after. And so, uh, so I'm going to show you some pictures now. Don't freak out. There's a few dead critters here. I didn't pick anything super, super nasty. <clears throat> but this is what we saw. This is what happened. So this is, let me orient you here. So this is close to, in this case, Cayugas Creek on the, on the left-hand side. And as we come over here, we're getting farther and farther away from the water source, more and more up the hill, et cetera. So this is in the middle of the creek. This is in the riparian corridor, floodplain, et cetera. And this is... And these are from camera trap data, from cameras that take a picture when someone, when motion triggers the, the camera. And so this is how many critters are we seeing per area per day. And so this is 2011, low numbers of stuff. Fair enough. <clears throat> August 2012, low, no, relatively speaking, low numbers of stuff. 2013, just before the fire, again, this is our, our students doing this. It was a class activity. And so uh, not meant to collect data per se, it was rather a, a training exercise for them. This is what happened right after in May. So the fire started in early May. This is in, in um, the week after that. Massively increased numbers of critters. So what had happened was all these critters ran away. And they ran away from the ones that could run away, ran away and ran into the, the relative refuge of the creek, initially the Oxnard Plain, and then quickly into the uh, riparian area. And then 2013, we see that again. And by 2014, things have died back. And so what we see is it's not equal amongst all things. The small, man, small animals were, were hit disproportionately hard. So <clears throat> big thing. So this is right after the fire. Deer, we're here. We're all okay. Here's, here's a mom and her babies. She's doing well. Here's a bobcat. No problemo. Here's a coyote. No problemo. The big guys could run away. They could physically run from those flames, get to a different location. The smaller guys couldn't. So this is a baby coyote, this is a cottontail rabbit, all kinds of stuff. I should go through this quick so I don't freak anybody out, but dead uh, wood, um, wood rat, snakes, etc. We saw the same pattern with the Thomas fire at a much larger scale. So we did see some things killed. This case is an adult mountain lion, it's actually a juvenile mountain lion. This is behind the hills in the Thomas fire where we were tracking. We saw some things like this juvenile bear who we had to euthanize, unfortunately. Um, but most of what we saw were these small things like this little rabbit uh, kill, these little, these little rodents. That pattern is incredibly important, we believe. When you talk to most people, they say, oh, the wildfire comes in, does its do, whatever, it's natural, right? To an extent, that's absolutely correct. Most of our vegetation, most of our communities have evolved with fire. Fires, as I mentioned before, some amount of fire is natural. The scale, because we've suppressed fire for so long, we've had an active policy suppressing fire, allowed this fuel stuff to build up when we do have these fires that are crazy when we add on climate change bark beetle lack of water all that stuff it gets really really crazy so whereas most folks would say oh this is bad these critters are nuked they'll come back quickly we don't think that's going to happen we don't think that the community is going to bounce back like they did back in the day it doesn't mean the world's over it doesn't mean we're not going to ever have any plants or, or rabbits again but it does mean that the old models aren't necessarily a guidepost for the future. And we see this in a whole variety of, of ways. Our drones and these tools are helping us understand this in terms of erosion. One quick example before I, I get off here is um, uh, erosion. So the whole Montecito thing, right? That was all about, oh, we had this huge erosion problem. Historically, we would look at this as a geomorphological issue, right? A geology, a shape of the land thing. So the fire came through, nuked all this stuff. OK, fair enough. And then when it rains a lot, that causes failures, right? Sure, of course that definitely happens. What we've also found is what we think is going on, we're trying to test this with the Thomas fire, but we think what we observed the Springs fire, and we're trying to see if this is the case now, 
the little guys all died. The big guys hunkered down at first. And then they're like, uh, now I'm on do, right? So where am I going to eat? If I'm a predator, where am I going to find prey? If I'm an herbivore, where am I going to find forage? We're seeing larger bodied critters disperse more, move around more. So what that means is, whereas we used to have you know, a deer trail and occasionally a deer walking on it with vegetation that held the ground together, now we have this, this family of deer walking across much more frequently across these areas, causing the nucleating centers for erosion. So they're stepping and starting the little, little, little rubble start of the avalanche. So that when we do get that rainfall, it's going to be that much more, it's potentially that much more devastating. So again, all these things are related. They're not isolated factors that we study. Um, uh, and you can see, as you can see from this drone image, this is again, we're flying from uh, the hills above Ventura down into, into um, uh, right behind City Hall in Ventura. There's all kinds of um, fantastic opportunities here, not just to help our community, but to help our students understand stuff. So to have, help them read this landscape, what does this mean? Can we tell how intense the fire was right here with this light ash and gray stuff versus over here when it was dark, et cetera? Um, all kinds of wonderful opportunities in classrooms. In this case, this is some satellite imagery that's processed that shows you very, very clearly the outline here of the Thomas fire. When we talk about what's going on possibly this evening with the evacuations, when we talk about what's been go what was going on with the Montecito uh, flood, uh, uh, floods, that stuff was all predicted, right? We didn't know exactly where the rainfall would dump so intensely it would call this, cause the problems, but all of this is, is well understood. I've seen the same exact thing with New Orleans, with, with Hurricane Katrina, with hurricanes in Puerto Rico, all these places around. People say, well, I didn't think it could happen here, right? And it's natural. People, in the case of Montecito, people are exhausted, right? People have been in there, uh, people were evacuated for a huge amount of time and for, you know, for weeks and weeks and they're totally exhausted and they come home and, you know, they just want to have Christmas and somebody says it's raining, oh, we got this little evacuation warning. Well, let's not, too, let's not worry too much about that, right? Huge problems, huge problems. This is a common phenomenon that we need to better understand. You need, stu you need folks like our students that are trained interdisciplinarily to understand that this really is an important warning. We really need to, do need to heed this. More importantly, we need to better communicate to our community what these real risks are. So simply saying, oh, the evacuation warning, that doesn't work, right? We need to communicate in ways that people understand. Um, uh, here's what actually happened. This is not produced by any government agency. This is produced by the people that live in and around Montecito. This is a citizen science sourced map. So underlying it's a Google Earth image. What you see is, and we, I just put, we just put it here on um, the floodplain right here, so the main riparian corridors. And this is where people themselves, before any first responders were able to get in and do detailed analysis, where they were recording destroyed structures, damaged structures, uh, folks that perished, et cetera, incredibly powerful. If we can better harness this technology, again, which our students are, are exposed to in our, in our classrooms, we can create more real-time warnings for people that are more valuable. The scale of this is crazy, right? So this is an underpass um, uh, under, underneath the roadbed. But I mean, look at that magnitude of stuff, right? Clearly, folks did not, if, if people understood this is what was coming down, of course they would have moved. Of course they would have gotten up and, and relocated. This was not people being stupid. This was people perhaps not being warned as well as we could have warned them. You know, again, the crazy boulders in the middle of the road, etc. Also, we study beaches, and I got this photo emailed to me about 300 times. People were like, oh my god, dude, there's a bear kill on the beach. And I went, really? I said, yeah. I said, wow, that's really cool. And I started looking, I'm like, that bear looks kind of weird. So uh, that was not a bear kill. That was not a Sandy Beach bear monitoring. <laughs> that was a stuffed grizzly from someone's house that washed out on the beach. <laughs> so again, the interdisciplinary approach, to be able to properly interpret what was going on is key, is key. But I still wish we had ever encountered a bear on the beach. Um, anyway, we'll just finish up here talking about the, the, the legacy of this, this spill, uh, this burn, excuse me, is still going on. The legacy of this material that's been spilled and dumped on the beach is still going on. And just like everything else, so New Orleans, this marks our, I forget, this is, I think is our 13th annual trip we're taking. Our program, our campus doesn't let go of things, which is kind of a problem, I guess, partly, but 
really, it's a strength. It's a strength. So, so we're not done because people, because this isn't in the newspapers anymore, right? We're still extremely interested. What's this doing to the geomorphology of the beach? What's this doing to the geology of the coast? What's this doing to the animal population for years to come, right? We're interested in that. And not only are we interested in that, we're baking this into our classes as the years go on, as lab activities, as, as, as um, trips to go show students stuff. And again, a really different approach to thinking about natural disasters. Again, helping folks understand what's going on, but also empowering our students with these real world experiences. And Ventura County and CSUCI are, are fantastic places to do that. So thank you very much for your guys' support for all that you, you do and help us with this stuff. Um, many of the, the suite of tools that we use for this are, are currently, um, shall we say, under threat by our federal government. A lot of the, the, our, our funding sources are, are ending for these, these cool tools because people think that um, we don't need to do this work on climate change or changing environment, but we think it's important. So thank you for your continued um, support for this, not only of our program, but all of these programs, and it really is making a huge difference. Thanks a lot, guys. looking for a good uh, maybe maybe this one maybe this one um, so uh, the answer is so the question is how did how did Montes, how did Montecito start and the, the answer is it started with this right so this is the burn scar so this this primed the pump for those those um, hillside destabilization efforts so this stuff happened um, we started getting so again had we been in a regular rain year the, the, the typical uh, uh, model of, of rain falling is first we get, you know, Chris, uh, not Christmas time, uh, Halloween, we get a little bit of light drizzle, a little bit of light rain, a little bit of rain, and then, and then we get more and more heavy rains till we get into the peak of the, the winter time, and then we get our downpour. That's not how we had our, our rainfall here, right? The very first rainfall was a big boom, big dump. So a couple things are gonna happen. One, the fire is gonna bake and change the chemistry of the soil. It's gonna make it so-called hydrophobic. So uh, initially, if we, did, if, if we, let's say, not had a fire, but just had tractors and cleared this area off, um, and it rained, it would be like the soil in your backyard or whatever, it would rain and that, that soil would kind of suck up at least some of that water, not here. After this fire, it basically makes it have a patina and have sort of a, uh, kind of almost like an umbrella over the top. So when it does rain, very little actually oozes into the ground. It just sort of hits it and runs off the side. As that stuff is running down the side, eventually some of it's gonna hit in cracks and start to cause little, little rocks to tumble down. And so, so, this is, so this is the nucleating center of that. And, and so it's getting primed, it's starting to cause problems. Some of that initial rain is going and it's plugging up, it's causing some of these rocks and things to go down in these channels, especially these, these three or four main channels. And they're, they're, they're um, creating hydrological discontinuities, they're creating uh, roughness in the channel. Then when we got, and I, I woke up, I think it was about 2.49 by my clock, we, we got a, a squall that came through the whole region, and that was the trigger. So the, so the trigger was not just rain and wet, but a disproportionate amount of rainfall over the definition within 15 minutes. And so that, that led to this huge catastrophic boom. And so we had, we had um, literally these walls, I, I, my other presentation actually had a video. I can show you guys a video, I guess, if we have a second. But um, a fanta amazing video from a realtor in Montecito where he's going to check on his parents, and he, and he goes in the street, and it's, it's obviously raining, so the street's a little bit wet, but it's raining, and he goes in, and he goes, hey, mom, and he goes, what? And he turns around, and there's a guy in a car, an SUV in the car, and he goes, turn around, dude, turn around. And the guy's like, what? And he said, turn around. So the guy, bzz, 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 bzz. and then literally about five seconds after the guy turns around, it's about three, four foot of water flooding down the street. And he runs inside, the TV showed that part, they didn't show the rest. He runs inside, closes the door, and then all of a sudden in his kitchen, the water in his, or parents' kitchen, the water comes up three feet. And that's all over the course of about 35, 45 seconds. So when, the, when, this, when this flow happened, it was a, a so-called catastrophic flood. So it was a broom, and it was this stuff backed up in these channels with boulders and stuff, and then it eventually just get started giving way. And it didn't all give way at once, it was over the course of you know, 15, 20 minutes.
but that was that was why we had these big slugs come blasting through. Does that answer your question? I don't know if that answers your question or not. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, so, so, the, so, right, so if you look at the destruction, the destruction is, is highly correlated with these, these channels. So absolutely. So, so the channels were the bad place to be in this, in this uh, setting. But, but what triggered it here was just a randomness that that cell Hap just happened to, to chill out over here for enough minutes that caused a downpour. Same exact thing could have happened in Ojai. Same exact thing could have happened above Ventura. Now, in the wake, in the, in the many weeks since then, our, our wonderful agencies have come in and done a yeoman's task of cleaning out a lot of these catch basins. And so they've created more capacity. So if that gunk comes down the hill, it's not necessarily going to plug up as quickly. So we're really well protected right now across most of our region. But again, tonight, if a big squall comes in and, and, and parks over, I don't know, uh, uh, Casita Springs or something, same exact thing could happen. So, the, so, the, so we, this is all very well known. What we, do, we can't predict is the exact you know, foot by foot dumping of rainfall. That, that's the only variable. But it wasn't that people didn't understand the risk, it was uh, people chose to communicate the risk um, in a way that maybe was not ideal. I guess I'd say it like that. Absolutely, absolutely. Again, so well, what we do know, and, and there's been some fantastic new maps that have been generated, particularly by Ventura County in the city of Santa Barbara, um, where we have we um, I don't have that picture up here, but. Um, uh, we have 12 different zones that we've created in the burn area the county of Ventura has created. And we know very well, here in this, in this zone, these are the most problematic streets, these are the most problematic uh, 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 culverts and things like that, and they've directed efforts. Indeed, we now have real-time uh, temporary weather stations in a lot of these areas, or just, just up the hill from any of these areas. So while you and I don't have it, our disaster, our emergency response personnel, they actually are getting real time, minute to minute rainfall data, and they can actually say, oh my gosh, this one is getting a gazillion you know, feet you know, per hour or whatever the dump is. Um, and actually, uh, now, during the Montecito effort, that didn't really happen, but since then, we've now been pre-positioning uh, resources. So first responders, fire trucks, et cetera, not just our area, but we've activated our, our mutual response, mutual aid network, and we have, uh, I don't know if it's happening tonight, but in previous rain events, we've had folks stationed around so they can respond. And again, that's being, they're being managed hour by hour based on the rainfall totals. So that's the value of adaptive management, right? That's the value of taking this stuff seriously. Uh, my, my friends and colleagues in Louisiana where we work, I just say maybe they don't take these risks as seriously when it comes to using the, the full force of our technology and our abilities to try to protect life and limb and, and resources. We here in Ventura, quite honestly, we're doing a kick butt job. This is, I mean, you should be very, very proud of your, of your public servants and your public agencies. They really are taking all of this in and trying to adapt and do a better job. Do we have any other questions for Dr. Henderson? Only one question. So regarding our town's fire, Sean, did you say it's going to take us up to five years for our things, our plant life to grow back? No, way more. Way more. So JB's question was five years-ish? No, more. So um, when you look at, so I'll give you an example uh, from our, again, if it was just the fire, sure, I don't know, I'll say number five, yeah, that sounds good. But again, coupled with this ongoing drought, the, and not just the drought, but when we do get rain, it's massive dumping. It's not the traditional rainfall pattern that has really hydrated our soils the way that plants have evolved with over the last you know, many thousands and millions of years. So um, I'll tell you a, small, a quick story, um, which is right behind our campus, we have a thing called Dudleyus viridia, which is a, uh, an endangered plant, a little succulent. And so we've been working with the Fish and Wildlife Service to help try to restore that plant before the springs fire, there was, depends on how you count them, they'll be fully counted, probably 50,000 individuals. Their distribution in the whole world went from the 101 
to Point Magoo. That was basically it. And then up to, to Satwewa, up to the, up the top of the hill. Um, little small thing, slow growing, chilling out. Um, uh, the fire happens, nukes this whole population. So we go from, say, 50,000 individuals to maybe, depends on how you want to measure them, 200 to 2,000 individuals. When you talk about, you, they, they mostly split asexually. So when we talk about the unique genetic heritage, maybe 50 individuals. So we've been working with the Fish and Wildlife Service for several years to see if we can restore them. It's not going well. So that plant has evolved for thousands and thousands and thousands of years and been fine with all the vagaries of climate and this and that. The lack of water is inhibiting its recovery. So that, that example from you know, the 2013 fire to now, they're not doing too well. And so again, does that mean all the plants are gonna go? No, the plants aren't gonna go away. But the communities are having a much, much harder time recovering. So a few weeds will pop back really quick. And indeed, if you go on mountain bike rides and stuff now, out in the hills behind Ventura, you'll see some stuff going. But you're not gonna see all of the complete sweep of the, the vegetative community that's come back. And because the burn was so complete, we're gonna see large swaths that are essentially bare for a long time. So five years, no. Mm, 10 years, maybe, maybe, something like that. Again, we don't know, that's best guess. This, this really is uncharted area, and again, I would encourage you guys when people, nerdy folks like me, tell you what's gonna happen, you should always be careful, whatever I say. Um, but, but we really are in uncharted waters. We do not have a good rudder to steer this ship. It's, maybe I'm totally wrong, but maybe it's gonna take 20 years, right? The point is, our guideposts from, the, from history are not necessarily gonna work in this brave new world that we're creating and creating more intensively every day with, with our changed uh, landscape. So, Yes, wow, depressing, I should say something positive. Um, but uh, we got some cool stuff behind the Ventura Mission. Right, so there's some cool archeology span going on. Um, so I would say, that's not a depressing thing, I would say, don't let that be depressing. Take that and be armored with that, right? That's baloney, we don't like, I don't like the fact that JB asks me a question and I don't know the answer, right? The answer is to study things more. The answer is to not cry and go and drink more beer and say how horrible life is. The answer is to get empowered and have conversations with folks and make effective change and decide the kind of future that we want to have. The kind of future we build at this university, the kind of future that we want to build for our children and grandchildren and all those folks. That's why we're doing this, right? So, so it is kind of crazy and kind of scary, but um, you know, uh, the blessings of being born in challenging times. Cool. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Can we get a round of applause for this?